Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson. And before I get to our guest here today, I'd like to remind everyone to please give a like and subscribe down below if you enjoy this content. We greatly appreciate it. We have Erica Smith here on the show. Erica is our fourth guest coming to us from the Great White North, right up above us. She's a powerlifting and running coach, which is interesting in enough of itself. She's also a fascial stretch therapist, and she's also a nutritional therapist, and she had her bachelor's in movement science, but most importantly, she's our current guest on the show. Erica, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's my first time being on a podcast, so thanks for having me. Absolutely. So why don't you give us a little bit of a backstory? What got you started into the powerlifting? What got you started into adapting the healthy and fit lifestyle? Um, To be honest, like, Fortunately, I've kind of always been into fitness. My parents put me into sports at a young age. I've played a lot of highly competitive sports for a long time. Um, but I think what inspired me to really get into the powerlifting was I was always into strength training. You know, in high school is when I first got my gym membership. I was, as I said, I was always involved in sports. And I noticed that the more strength training I did, the better results I got. It helped to improve my running. I improved my running time, my performance overall. It just like made me feel better. I liked the way I physically looked as I did more strength training. Um, so my husband and I, we worked for Good Life Fitness for a long time. And then we opened up our own gym in 2016. And then we actually didn't start off as a powerlifting gym. We were more of a CrossFit type gym. But we had a group of powerlifters who were looking for a new gym. They came into our community, we had them at our facility, and things kind of took off from there, and then I started to compete in powerlifting, and I've been coaching powerlifting for a few years, so I actually started coaching powerlifting before I competed in it. Um, but yeah, that's how I really got into it. Yeah, that's awesome. So did you find that when you started out with the powerlifting that your body adjusted really, really quickly, or did it take a little bit more time for it to sort of make progress? For me personally, it actually adjusted really quickly, because as I said, um, I've been doing strength training for a long time it just took it to a whole nother level really because obviously I was doing lower reps heavier loads I was following an actual program so my my body personally adjusted quite well but for most people if they haven't done strength training before it will take quite a while to adjust because if you have any mobility or flexibility issues you have to fix that before you can do these heavy compound movements just exactly like me, I'm 6'3", so anything that has to do with flexibility or anything, that's that's not really going to work out for me. But one of the big things that I like to, to ask people is because I've always found that if you walk into a gym with 100 people in it, you're going to have 100 different ways that people do stuff. Or if you were to ask people, they're going to say, you know, do this many reps, lift this amount of weight, or this is how you lift it, or this is the type of nutrition. Was that hard for you starting out to sort of find out what exactly worked best for you? Yeah, I think especially when I was younger, it was a lot harder because there's a lot of misinformation out there. You know, you have companies giving misinformation on TV ads, magazines, and especially the internet now. There's so much misinformation out there that's hard to decipher what's right and what's wrong. Um, but fortunately for me, I do have a Bachelor of Human Kinetics. So as I got older, I was able to decipher between what's valid peer-reviewed science and what isn't. So for me, fortunately, I am really good at deciphering what's real and what isn't. But for a lot of other people out there, I know it can be very challenging. That's why it is important, you know, to do your research. Make sure you're hiring a coach that experience and has knowledge, um, not just someone who has 10,000 followers on Instagram or whatever it might be. You know, you really got to do your research and make sure you're hiring the right people and getting the information from the right people. Absolutely. So when you were getting your bachelor's in movement science, what was what would you say is the most surprising fact that you found during your during your studies? Um, I think that when it comes to health and nutrition and fitness in general, it really is simple. And as I said, that's where it comes to all the companies and everything, because everyone's trying to run a business. Everyone's trying to profit. So everyone's trying to prove that their product is what will work for you. And then that's the only product that will work for you. But, um, yeah, so as I, sorry, what was the question again? I totally forgot. What, what was, what would you say was the most surprising fact that you learned during your studies in uh, movement science when you were oh, at yeah, college? Sorry. Yeah. So yeah, that it's, yeah. Um, that it really is simple. You know, when you look at the meta analysis of studies out there, especially when it comes to nutrition, just eat a lot of fruits, a lot of vegetables and you know, healthy, lean proteins. And a lot of people think you need all these supplements and whatnot, and you don't. Supplements should be used as a last resort. It really is simple, you know, just 
keeping it basic, eating wholesome, natural foods. A lot of people are always looking for that quick fix, mm -hmm. but when you look up a lot of the highly intelligent people, there is no quick fix, you know? It's, it's just taking it slow and steady, making the right small changes at a time, and over time, you'll build those healthy habits. Mm -hmm. And also drink a lot of water. Yes, yes. liquid is very important, yes. yes. And water is the only liquid your body technically needs. Yes, abs yeah, absolutely. So when you were starting out powerlifting, did you find it, I mean, there's always this complaint and misconception that, I mean, still exists, uh, but it has gotten better when it comes to, you know, Instagram promoting it, that women have this, still have, some of them have this fear that if they touch one weight, they're going to hulk out and turn into Dwayne The Rock Johnson just overnight. Did you ever, even when you were younger, did you ever have that fear? Of course. I think especially as a female, there's this notion that, Either, you know, if you're eating more or training harder that you're either going to get fat or you're going to get bulky or your body's going to change in some sort of negative manner. And that's not the case whatsoever, at least if you're doing it naturally, I should say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, for me personally, you know, like I've been working my butt off for years to put on muscle. I'm not trying to get super big, but I am trying to put on more muscle mass. And I've been training hard for years and it is very hard to put on muscle mass. And I think a lot of people who aren't really into fitness don't understand that um yeah so i'm i'm proof i know you can't see i was literally person. going to say that out of all the people that you could follow on instagram she is the number one living proof of disproving that myth that if you just touch one weight because she's been working her tail off and yes she still looks just amazing and she doesn't look hulk out at all so everyone out there just take one look at her instagram page and that myth is entirely lost validation yeah, yeah, no, it, it, it's very hard to get big and bulky. And even if you do want to get like big and bulky and put on a lot of fat mass, it's very hard. Like it's not as easy as people think it is. I always tell the story. There's a girl that I knew in college who I, I, that's when I really started getting into the health and fitness myself was in college and she didn't want to go to the gym with me and I just kept trying to convince her and she's like, no, I don't want to get like too bulky. I don't want to become huge. And I even told her, I said, the purse that you carry when we go out to like nightclubs or anything like that weighs more than a lot of those weights that you'd be using in the gym and you don't get bulky. Yep. So then that finally convinced her and then she ended up losing some weight and getting a lot healthier and then she really thanked me for it. So I just think it's one of those things too where especially for women, once you get there and once you actually start and you realize that it's not true, then that really, really helps. And there's also that misconception that the gym is just going to have these big burly guys that are just going to like taunt you or say mean things to you. But people don't realize when you get to the gym, 99.9% .9 of the people there do not even know that you exist. They're too busy focusing on their own workouts. Exactly. Exactly. So, I 100% ex agree. And honestly, as a gym owner and as someone who's been in the powerlifting industry for a little while, 99% of the biggest, bulkiest guys and uh, females as well are the friendliest people. Absolutely. If you not, like 99.9% .9 mm -hmm. of them, you look at them, they look intimidating, especially if they have, you know, they're, they're big, they're muscular, they have all this powerlifting equipment, it seems intimidating. But you get to know them, and they are the friendliest people. It's it's amazing. Oh, for, yeah, from all the health and fitness guests I have on, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, they are so nice. We had one girl on here who could bench like 380 pounds, I think was her top thing, and she was one of the nicest people I've ever met in my entire life. So, yeah, it's just it's just such a big misconception. That's one of the questions I like to ask them is, like, do you ever have to feel you have to, ever have to be extra nice? And then they always say, yeah, unfortunately we do. So that's one of the things that I think is tragic about that. But when you were starting out, how did the nutrition come? into play was that early on or did it sort of take a while for you to adapt to the nutrition aspect um well for me as I said because I've kind of always been into health and fitness nutrition has always been important to me I started really focusing on my nutrition when I was in high school as I got older I focused on it more and more and more but especially as I got more competitive especially with the powerlifting with my running um the more I was training and the harder I was training the more important the nutrition became so as I continue to get older, I just continuously hone in on my nutrition more and more. I'm constantly making improvements over time. Mm -hmm. So when it came down to the nutrition, most people don't realize when you are putting on muscle, when you are getting bigger, you are more than likely going to have to eat more than you had eaten, even if you were out of shape before you started getting healthy. Was that hard for you to eat more? Or did it just come naturally where you're just like, oh my God, yes, I can eat finally eat more? Um... No, it definitely is harder and especially everyone's, it's so individualistic, right? Like for me, I, when I was trying to put on weight, I was going through a lot of stress in my life and when you're, at least for me, when I'm stressed out, it's very hard for me to eat more. 
Um, but I would say in general, it's worked out like amazing because obviously you're as a power lifter, I'm putting on more muscle. I have to increase my protein intake if I want to continue to improving my strength um, overall. So for me, I just made small increments over time and I've noticed that my weight has just maintained. I haven't increased weight at all. Even though I've slowly been increasing my calories, increasing my protein intake, my weight has maintained. My strength has continued to improve, which is really good. Um, so for me, it wasn't too hard for me, as I said, because I didn't make any drastic changes. I just made small changes at a time. But it's been amazing because the more muscle mass I put on, the higher my basal metabolic rate is. So you're obviously burning more energy. You need to consume more calories, consume more protein in order to um, sustain what the training I'm doing. So who doesn't want to do that, right? Who doesn't want to be able to have to eat more or who doesn't not want to eat more? Absolutely. So what has the struggle been like for you personally? I know when everyone gets the image of a power lifter, they think about someone who's like 300 pounds, who's just benching, you know, basically like lifting refrigerators, basically. When, and when, when they look at you, they think they, people are kind of like, huh? What has that struggle been like for you at the gym? Or is it kind of, I've always loved, loved to ask this for, especially for when we have people that are a little bit shorter on too. Is there, is that such a great feeling when you go in the gym and then people see you and then they don't expect you to then just rep max out all this stuff and then just to see their faces drop? Is that something that you enjoy? Oh yeah. It's a, yeah, for <laughs> sure. I definitely enjoy it because people always underestimate me. You're like, oh, she's just a short little blonde girl. She's just a skinny <laughs> little girl. Like what, what can she do really? Right. And especially when I go into a corporate gym, they're not used to seeing powerlifters and whatnot. If you train there, like everyone's mind blown. Like, whoa, where did this come from? But I think a lot of people forget too that. Yes, even though there are still many of those stereotypical big power lifters, there's different weight divisions and age divisions. So you're going to have sub juniors, you're going to have juniors, you're going to have open, you're going to have masters, people who are really, really, really old power lifting, really young power lifting. Same thing with weight. The, I'm in the 47 kilogram category. So that's uh, 103.6 pounds. So that's the lightest category for the open um, division. But it goes up to you know, for the guys for 120, 120 plus kilos. So you're competing in your weight category, right? So I think a lot of people forget that. Yeah. So like if someone would say like 400 pounds, is there a max amount of weight or max amount that you can weigh in order to compete? Or is it just like, there's just like a 20 or is this like 120 kilogram plus division then? Yes. Oh. Yeah. So that's the biggest one for the males is the 120 plus. So whether you're 121 kilograms or you're 250 kilograms, you'll be competing in that same category. If you're 250 kilograms, you probably wouldn't be able to walk to get to the bar, but that would definitely be an interesting interesting sight to see. So at what point did you decide that you wanted to do like a powerlifting competition? Was that early on or did it take a while to sort of get that mindset? For me, I was very eager to get into it. Honestly, the reason why I started competing as a powerlifter is I just wanted to have some fun and hit some PRs. I was like, mm -hmm. I have not, even though I strength train regularly, I haven't pushed myself hard enough. I haven't followed a program to a T and I haven't hit a PR in like over two years. So is that the point where it's like, you know what? I want to take this seriously. I want to have some fun with it and I want to hit some PR. So that's why I got into it. I had my husband do my programming for me because he's a gym owner and powerlifting coach as well. Um, but yeah, and it's been a lot of fun. I've Within a matter of a few months, I was already hitting PRs and I've already made PRs over top of those PRs. So like, it's been great. All right. So here's the point in the podcast where you just absolutely embarrass us. What are your best powerlifting lifts? Um, so for bench press, I've done 57 and a half kilos for squat. I've done 82 and a half kilos. And then for deadlift, I've done a hundred kilos. Wow. Yep, yep, that's definitely going to embarrass... I mean, that's half the audience right now is dropping the laptops right now and going to the gym right now because that's just that's just mind-blown right there. So when you did your first powerlifting meet, was it, ever, was it what you expected it to be or was it a little bit different? What was that experience like? Um, well, I'd say the first time I coached a powerlifting meet, I honestly didn't have much for expectations because it was a whole new experience for me. At the time, I was not a certified powerlifting coach. I uh, basically took on a client and she was just really strong. So it kind of was like, hey, do you want to do powerlifting? Like, you're really strong. Let's do this. She, did, she said she wanted to continue training with me, even though I knew next to nothing about powerlifting at the time. Um, so when we first went there, yeah, I didn't know what to expect. I learned a lot just from going to the first meet. But by the time I actually started competing, I had a lot more knowledge 
an experience with powerlifting. So I was super calm and confident going into the competition when I actually competed. One of the scary things about powerlifting though is that I see those videos on YouTube of those powerlifting fails where people, you know, just, yeah, I, I, I don't recommend people watching those. It'll make you cringe. But have you ever had an experience like where you were saved at the last second or where you were close to, you know, collapsing? And if so, was it hard for you to then like get back on and start lifting again? Or was it a thing where you had to take time off? If you've had an experience like that, how has it been? So fortunately, fortunately for me, I have not had that experience. You know, I always make sure the safeties are up when I'm doing squats or bench press. Um, I'm making sure if I need a spotter that I have a spotter. I take all the safety precautions. But I would say we definitely had that situation in our own gym with other athletes when they are training at 3 a.m. in the morning. And um, it was just the one athlete and his two buddies were training together. And there was no spotter and he was doing an equipped squat. Mm. And unfortunately, when he was down at the bottom of the squat, his knee just caved in. And then, yeah, it was a disaster. I had to go to the hospital. Yeah. Um, he's injured for quite a while. So when you have those experiences happen very close to you, it definitely makes you rethink things. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's part of the sport, right? It is a very high-risk sport. You are doing heavy loads. Technique is very, very, very important. And even if you are doing perfect technique, things can still happen, right? So mm -hmm. it's definitely an eye-opener eye when that kind of stuff happens. But fortunately, as I said, for me, I take the safety precautions seriously and I've had none of those issues yet. And hopefully I never will. One of the benefits, I think, especially for you being that you don't look like a bodybuilder, you don't look like really a power lifter is that you're kind of anonymous not not saying that like you're like people don't recognize you but like you don't have the constant stares you don't have like the attention that someone like that would get do you think that that is a positive thing for you or do you think that that sometimes makes people underestimate you and that can kind of lead to them not maybe being so inclusive um for me i view it as a positive you know like i'm i'm, ne I'm a very shy person so i don't want all eyes on me to begin with um but yeah, so I've never been the kind of person that wants to have the attention on me or anything. So I personally view it as a positive, but I think other people out there might have a different view on that. Yeah, because I was going to say, like, for all the people that I've had on, I've had women that are just huge. I've had guys that are just huge, and then they just get stared at all the time. But I was like, it must be refreshing to, you know, have that strength and still be able to just be anonymous in the crowd. Like, people just won't stare at you. I mean, that that's that's really the best of both worlds that you're living right now. So what would you say is the number one misconception that people have about powerlifters in general that, that, you would, that you would like to break? I think it's honestly kind of what you just mentioned there, that all powerlifters are these big, bulky, stereotypical physique powerlifters, and that's not the case whatsoever. Like, yes, I did running for a long time. I still do running. I compete both in running and powerlifting. Um, but obviously, when people look at me, if they look on my social media, I'm five foot two. I weigh 100 pounds. I'm not the stereotypical, bo uh, sorry, powerlifter body, but yet I do have a lot of strength, which mm -hmm. is kind of fun because obviously then when people <laughs> see me on the platform or they see me training in the gym, they're like, oh, no, she can actually lift weight. She is strong, you know? So it's, it's definitely fun to prove people wrong. In you that probably aspect. make people's day, though, when they see that. And they're like, oh, my God, you guys, you can't believe what I saw at the gym today. This, li this little girl came up, and she was just she was just killing it. Like, I don't know what's going on. So and it helps to influence the younger people as well, oh. right? If there's young little girls out there that are yeah. tiny, they see someone with my physique mm -hmm. actually lifting heavy weights, and they're like, oh, hey. Maybe I can do that too. Or like we said, especially your people that are afraid that they're going to get too huge, you, they just look at you and then they'll be like, oh, so you can, you know, maintain that look while exactly. still being super strong. So, and that's probably the, the most positive thing that I just can't thank you enough for because there needs to be more people like that out there that represent that, especially, you know, with Instagram out there and everyone posting pics all the time. But when it comes down also to the, to the lifting aspect how does your running, do you think, affect it? Because when it comes down to running, you're really burning off a lot of calories then that you could use for um, building muscle. Have you found a way to compensate for that? Or is it one of those things that you think actually helps you? To be honest, I would say the powerlifting helps my running performance quite a bit. It helps to improve my fast twitch muscle fibers. And um, But when I'm the other way around, I would say technically, yes, my running does impede my powerlifting a bit. But that's because... Of the way I choose to train I do basically about on average I say 10 minutes of cardio 
and then I do my powerlifting training, and then I'll do another 10 minutes of cardio afterwards. So doing that cardio beforehand, for me, I use it more as a warm-up. I technically usually feel better when I do that. Um, but when you look at the science behind it, yes, it is technically impeding my powerlifting a little bit, but not that much. And to me, I love both sports, which is why I choose to compete in both sports. I don't think I'm ever going to be the best 47 kilogram powerlifter in the open female division. Maybe one day I will, who knows? But for me, that's not the end goal. I I really do enjoy both, both sports, which is why I choose to compete in both sports. Mm -hmm. But they do they do really do complement each other very well overall. What was it like the first time you put on? I I don't know what it's called, but that really stretchy thing that they make you wear when you're doing the powerlifting meets. Is it just a unitard or what Singlet? is? It? Yeah, yeah, the singlet. What was that like for the first time? Because I can imagine, I mean, I, I've worn Under Armour for, like, sports or whatever, and that's, I mean, probably the closest I could ever come to wearing something like that. What was that experience like? Yeah, to be honest, I will not lie. The first time I put it on, it's like, I don't feel great in this. This is not <laughs> a good look on me. I don't think it's a good look on most people. But as I've competed in this sport for a while now, and it's just kind of grown on me to me, and now it's just, it's like my second skin. It's just something I wear. It's normal. But if you actually look on my social media just a few days ago, I did make a post requesting that anyone out there in Canada come up with singlets that are more stylish, more modern, more colors, more patterns to make it more modern overall. Um, that would be nice, but it's very strict restrictions that they have when making that type of apparel. So I understand why there's companies that haven't got mm -hmm. to that point yet. But I definitely think they need to make it a little bit more modern, for sure. That perfectly almost led into a question that I was going to ask you, but I probably won't. Because the most popular question that I think I ask is, I ask the female bodybuilders or the figure competitors that, you know, it's a lot harder for women who with muscles to buy clothes because there's limited options. So, and then at the end, I always say, you know, if there's anyone out there in the audience that, you know, announce that is able to come up with a way of that, that's a multi-million dollar idea. But like I said, you have the best of both worlds. You don't really have to worry about the, the, the clothes thing too much I don't think so I'll just skip that question altogether but one of the things that I found when I started putting on muscle was an, as a negative was when I, I would get asked all the time by people like Ryan can you come over and help me move some of my furniture Ryan can you help me open these pickle jars that I have has have you found that that's happened to you and how do you deal with that to be honest I think because I'm a female yeah. I don't have that happen to me. And I'm not going to complain because there's a lot of times when we have friends that are moving into new places and I'm not the first person they ask and I don't mind that to be honest. My husband on the other end, yeah, he gets asked that stuff all the time to help. So that's something I'm not going to complain about. Um, <laughs> technically, yes. It is sexist, but I'm not going to complain about that hey, one. <laughs> hey, sometimes it works in it. Sometimes it works in yeah. good ways. But yeah, I like I say, my entire summer, every weekend almost is just full of just Ryan, come, I got a couch, and yeah, it's one of those things where I just I've accepted it. Where I was just like, okay, I'm bigger. I'll I'll be able to lift those. I'll lift that stuff. So you know, it's it's just one of those things. But yeah. when you're at a powerlifting meet, there's obviously different like techniques that people use different ways to pump themselves up. Do you have any specific techniques that you use like pre-lift? Like we have people that like, you know, like pat themselves down or whatever, or they do stuff with the chalk. Do you have like a specific technique or like ritual before you go into a lift in order to psych yourself up? To be honest, I am a very calm lifter. So when I am about to go on the platform, I actually will, usually there's a little space and area right behind the curtain that all the athletes will stay. I segregate myself, I'll actually go elsewhere and I'll just sit in a corner and be by myself. That way I'm just, I don't even listen to music usually, I'll just be focused, like um, just staying calm, doing my own thing, I'm just there, relaxed, and then right before I'm about to go on, then I'll go behind the curtain and then go on the platform. I don't do any, any trap slaps, no like crazy angry music or anything like that. I'm a very calm and focused lifter. Um, there's been a couple times where I will listen to calming music, but that's pretty much it, to be honest. I'm, I'm very different than most lifters. Most lifters are like you described. They're either, yeah, listening to the angry music, doing screams, getting slapped hard on the back or doing, I never did get that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, there's a lot of people who need to get that amped mm -hmm. up, get that energy going before they go onto the platform, but I'm the complete opposite. I like, I need to be focused. I'm calm. So I can just focus on my lips and do my thing. I mean, I'm a big guy, but if I got slapped as hard as some of those people get slapped, I'd be like, dude, I'm sore. I can't do this lift now. What are you talking about? But yeah, yeah. it's just it's just about psyching themselves up. 
But when you are at these lifts or these events, do you find that um, when it comes to crowd response, does that really get you amped up? Like, what's that like for you when you walk up and you're about to do the lift? Is it just a lot of tension building up or are you just calm, cool, and relaxed usually? Uh, there's definitely some nerves in there, especially when I right before I do my first attempt for my first squat. Usually after that, I'm a lot more calm. Um, but it's hard to say that, to be honest, uh, a lot of the powerlifting meets I've been to, the crowd has been pretty quiet in general. They, they're not very amped up they're not yelling they're not screaming um but the few times that the crowd has gotten into it and i can hear them really like getting into it it definitely does help like if the crowd's yelling at me to like just lift it up i'm not going to give up i'm going to keep going whereas if it was silent i'd probably give up on the lift a lot more easily so it it definitely can have an effect Mm -hmm. Now, the most important, I mean, or the most interesting, I'd say, when I saw your Facebook, we had this story before, she's a stretch therapist, and the the thing that she stretches, it sounds like, it looked to me the first time I saw it like facial, so I was just flabbergasted what that means, but being a stretch therapist, what exact, could you explain to the audience what you exactly do? Yeah, so fascial stretch therapy, what really differentiates this from other modes of treatment like chiro, physio, is you're tractioning the joint. So you're creating more space in the joint capsule, which allows me to get better mobilization out of the body. So when I'm doing this, I'm doing it, uh, the client's on a massage table, and basically there's two straps where their legs are strapped down. Um, but essentially, it's just a really relaxed form of assisted stretching. That's the simplest way to explain it. It's a pain-free way of stretching. It's just in a relaxed, more relaxed way. What is your personal opinion on stretching? I mean, obviously, you're probably an advocate of it, but I've heard so many people say, like, oh, you don't need to stretch. Stretching can sometimes hurt your body. Has your opinion on stretching changed over time, or have you always sort of been in the same position? Um, I've pretty much always been in the same position. For me, static stretching, where you're just holding, you know, a standard stretch for 30 seconds, you're in that same position. That's something you should always do after a workout to help Uh, relax the tissues especially if you do strength training strength training really tightens them up and it just allows the tissues to relax more um there's some conflicting research you know people used to think that if you did that before a workout that it would actually negatively impact it because you wouldn't get as much uh, power out of it but now there's research showing that that's not so much true anymore um but definitely i still stick to just to be a little bit safer doing more dynamic stretching before a workout because that way you don't have to worry about relaxing the tissues too much or anything, but they're still getting relaxed enough that you don't have that tightness or pain that you were experiencing. But that's where things like foam rolling are really effective as well. Um, I like to do that either pre-workout, intra-workout, or post-workout, I find. It can help, same thing, just like dynamic stretching. It can help to relax the tissues, but not to the point where you're so relaxed that it's going to negatively impact your workout or anything like that. Mm. So how important to you is what or what would you say is the most important thing when it comes to stretching just to make sure that you're not overdoing it and to make sure that you is there like a limit that you should know as a person when you're stretching to know like oh okay I probably shouldn't overdo it Um I think that's where things like hot yoga and stuff mm-hmm. like that can be you have to be careful with that because in, since you're in such a warm environment it's easily easier to, to um do more of a stretch and overstretch your tissues But if you're in just like a normal environment, normal temperature in a gym setting or something like that, generally I tell people just you should feel a little bit of a tension, but you shouldn't be in pain. If you're in pain, you're probably pushing yourself too much, but you should feel a little bit of tension. You should feel that stretch actually occurring. Mm -hmm. Is it hard knowing that people's bodies are so differently, they all come in all shapes and sizes, that people's stretch points are going to be different? Like, obviously, if you have a taller person, they might not be as flexible as a shorter person. Is that hard for you at first to sort of gauge what a person's limit is or what benefits them most? Yeah, it's all it's all individualistic, right? Because for someone who sits at a desk all day and is working at a computer from 9 to 5, five days a week, their hips are probably going to be really tight versus someone else who's a gymnast and they're doing they're a professional gymnast that's what they do you know they're an olympian who's training everyone's body is very different it depends on your daily activities it depends on your lifestyle um so that's why in general yeah my general rule is just like you should feel tension but no pain so now being a nutritional therapist what would you say is the biggest misconception people have about healthy eating when it comes to nutrition i think a lot of people think that eating healthy is expensive when in fact it's not. When you look at the bigger picture, um, 
you really don't want to be spending money, yes, on the cheaper stuff right now, because then down the road, you're going to be spending more money on the medical bills and fees and things like that, right? And a lot of people think that, yeah, having eating out, it's a $10 meal for lunch, a $10 meal for dinner, $5 for this snack here and there. When you're doing those small increments, it doesn't seem like mon that much money. It just seems like chunk change. Whereas when someone goes to the grocery store, usually they're buying in big bulk, right? They're buying all their groceries for the week, they're spending $200 right then and there. So it seems like it's really expensive. But for me, when I actually compare when I eat out versus when I get groceries and I make my food at home for that entire week, getting the groceries and making my own meals is actually much cheaper than eating out for every meal. Mm -hmm. One of the big things that I hear from people that I know personally is that some people might be lactose intolerant and they say, like, how can I still get that protein if I can't really drink milk? What are some good alternatives that you recommend for people that might be lactose intolerant when it comes to getting that protein still? Um, well, obviously, your usually biggest sources of protein are your meat sources mm -hmm. of protein. You get the most protein per serving. So obviously, the, the ones that everyone knows, you know, turkey, chicken, eating lean beef, things like that. For non-meat sources of protein, other than fish and whatnot, there are protein in vegetables. You have to be a little bit more stingy and look at the nutrition label, but edamame beans and some certain types of green peas and red kidney beans, things like that are actually very high sources of protein. For a chicken breast, usually it's around, what, 21 grams of protein per serving. When you have half a cup of beans, that's the exact same. It's around 21 grams of protein. So you just have to... Sometimes, you know, for some people, it's really easy, actually. You just go on Google or whatever. You can find lots of sources of protein that don't have lactose in them. Yeah, I, could, I couldn't agree more. So before we get to our audience here at part of the podcast, the questionnaire, you mentioned before that you have a husband, and I'm just, I love asking couples these questions, so we're going to ask, like, three quick questions and get, just get your answer. So how did you and your husband meet? Huh, we met at Good Life Fitness in Ottawa. Funny story. Um, I was hired. He was my boss. <laughs> So in the beginning, it was a big no-no. I was like, no, you, you never date the boss. You never date <laughs> your staff member. So I, I didn't tell anyone that I was interested in him. No one knew. And then I actually found out that he was interested in me. And that's how things kind of flew from there. <laughs> Did you have? Were you still working there when you started? Did you kind of have to say, like, hey, this isn't going to work out? How'd that work? Um, yeah, no. So it's funny. I couldn't, the one location I couldn't work at because my sister was managing. So I was working at this location. And at the time... It was a no-no to, you can't, the boss can't date trainers, nothing mm -hmm. like that. Um, so we did keep it on the hush-hush for a little while, but it, it was pretty obvious. Our staff members found out <laughs> pretty soon. Um, so we just had to keep it a secret from our regional manager, mm -hmm. because if our regional manager found out, then he would have moved one of us to a different location. So, yeah, we kept it on the hush-hush until we moved out to Calgary, and then it wasn't an issue or anything. Oh, yeah. So where did you guys go for your first date? Um, it's funny, actually, we went to a bar, we went to a local pub right by the gym because he gave me the choice, I believe it was going for mini golf or for going to the pub. Mm. And I decided to go to the pub because I knew I was super, super nervous. And I knew that <laughs> having a little bit of alcohol would help to relax yeah. me a bit. So I chose going to the pub. Well, here's what you do. You go to the pub and then you mini golf after the pub. We could have done that. You see how good you are a little intoxicated at the mini golf. Now, that makes a really, really interesting night. So, lastly, how did he propose to you? Um, it was awesome, actually. We were in Fernie. It was my first time going to Fernie. We were doing a snowboarding trip, and we were at the top of the mountain, and he kind of pulled me aside because a lot of times, especially on the bigger mountains, we'll snowboard down a bit. We'll stop, rest for five minutes, and continue snowboarding down. So at one point, um, we stopped near the top, and then we walked over to this area that had, like, a beautiful view of all the landscape, all the mountains. And that's, you know, he started telling me how much he loves me and all that stuff and got down on one knee and did the proposal. And so, yeah, it was, it was a really good moment. It was a really special moment. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I'm just a sucker for those stories, so I love hearing them. But now we get to our audience favorite part of the podcast, the questionnaire, sort of a getting to know you, where I'll ask you about a dozen or so questions. We'll get your responses. And we'll see, we'll see how they match out with everyone else. So for the first question, what is your go-to workout song right now at the moment? Um, I'm trying to think. What is it? 
I don't really have a song to be honest. I don't. There's not like one go-to I have. I just listen because we have Spotify on, so it's just like whatever's playing on Spotify. Yep. <laughs> as long as it's not country, I hate country music. Thank God. Yes, finally someone else who who has that opinion. It's 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 been a while before we've got that on this podcast, so I can't thank you enough for that. But now for our second question, if you could work out with any celebrity on the planet, who'd it be? Ooh. To be honest, it'd probably be Heidi Summers, also known as Buff Bunny, yes. because that's someone I've been following on YouTube for a long time. I'm just a big fan of what a positive impact mm-hmm. she's had on um, the industry. And, you know, a lot of people are always looking for the biggest, most famous people or the most intelligent people. But I just think she's done such a great job at empowering women and just empowering females in general and just having a positive outlook on everything. So that's a big, big win in my books. And I got to tell you, you are, I think, the 22nd health and fitness guest I've had on, and 19 of them have been women and three have been men. That is only the second time that a woman has been mentioned for the celebrity that you'd want to work out with. So that's that's okay. that's that's great, too. But I got to say, well, mainly because our pop, most popular answer was 17 votes is The Rock. Everyone says The Rock. Oh, yeah. That would have been my husband's yep, answer. Yep. For sure. Well, The Rock is a beast, so I got to give him props for that. I mean, it's The Rock, so yeah. you kind you kind of have to say that. But now, if you could train any celebrity on the planet, who would it be? If I could train someone, that's really tough to be honest. Honestly, like I would love to take one of the current. I'm not going to say a specific name, but one of the current big powerlifters. Doesn't matter if they're in Canada or the states. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of them, I'm just realizing now, are just learning about all the basic aspects of training that my husband and I have been doing for years. Mm-hmm. And it seems like some of these powerlifters, they're just starting to learn about it now. So I think it would be fun to train one of them and see how they would do with my training versus their current coach. Mm-hmm. How, how would you say your training differs when it comes to you know all the knowledge that you have of powerlifting from someone who is just starting out? Is it just you would teach them different moves, different techniques? What would you say is the main difference? We focus a lot on mobility, flexibility, focusing on any muscle imbalances there might be. You have to really make sure you have that foundation before you can progress to the heavy loads and the more advanced movements. A lot of people just want to get big and bulky fast or lose weight really fast or whatever their goal is. They try to really skip the basic steps and just go to the big weights and the big compound movements. And you're going to cause more harm than good when you do that in the long run because you're just putting yourself at risk for injury that way. So we take into a lot of factors, not just that stuff. We take into account nutrition. We take into account their sleeping habits, how they're managing stress, because all those lifestyle factors have a huge um, impact on not just your training, but how your body recovers as well. And obviously, the recovery affects your training. It's that cyclical cycle. So. I am super happy because we'll, we'll we'll pause the questionnaire now for probably the next minute. But the biggest topic that I like to bring up because no one ever talks about it on Instagram, no one ever talks about it on YouTube, is sleep when it comes to recovery. Sleep is so undervalued. I think, well, it's not undervalued, but when it comes to talking about it, no one ever talks about it. But what is your current sleep schedule like and what do you like to tell your clients? What is a healthy amount that you recommend that they get? So I think for most people, to be honest, most people do need around seven to eight hours of good quality sleep. That's what just from personal experience over time and with the experience with my own clients and whatnot, I find that really is the kind of magic number. Not for everyone. Some people, depending if they have, you know, a hard labor job, maybe their body does need more sleep. They need more time to recover and whatnot. Um, But yeah, sleep has a huge impact on your training and your recovery and everything. So Sleep is very important. I think it's very undervalued to most people. Sleep is huge, except the only person that I've never seen it affected to, in my old gym, we had an ex-Navy SEAL, and that guy, he came in a few days, and he'd be like, yeah, I haven't slept in 48 hours, but I figured I'd come and lift today or whatever. And that that's just from his SEAL training that he's just used to that crap. So I was like, okay, dude, I don't know what you're made of, but that's just the most amazing. And he'd still be like doing his regular lifts. Like no, none of his weight or anything would suffer. And I was just, that was the... The, one of the coolest things I've ever seen in my entire life. But now back yeah, to that's rare. You, oh you yeah, that but those seal all. those seal guys are just they're just a whole different breed of humans. So that's just oh my god. But now back to the questionnaire. What is one item that you always need to have in your fridge? Um, this is gonna sound stupid, but to be honest, I have broccoli. Ooh. 
I like because I I honestly like I love fruits. I love vegetables. I eat broccoli almost every single day. If not, I have it every other day. It's just one of those foods. I don't know why. I love it. I crave it all the time. So I eat it almost like with every dinner. Doesn't matter because our our most embarrassing answer. One person said mustard, and that was definitely interesting to figure out. But yeah, broccoli, to be honest, I have not had broccoli in probably like 12 years because I just didn't like it as a kid. So it's got to be something that I definitely got to try again because it's been way too long. So yeah, it's yes. all the way you cook it too. It's all yeah. in the way you cook it. Yeah, absolutely. So what is one thing that people who follow you on Instagram would be surprised to find out if they met you in person? Hmm. Probably that I'm actually like a really, really chill relaxed person even though my social media like I do love physical activity I do lots of physical activity I'm involved in doing stuff all the time snowboarding hiking running powerlifting obviously all those things but when I'm not at the gym or I'm not doing those activities I'm just usually on the couch relaxed and that's what I like to do when I'm at home I'm in my chill zone Yep. yep what is one thing that you find funny that most people don't Mm. well it's tough to say because I feel like there are a lot of people that watch this but a lot of the jokes from South Park I'm yeah. that's my number one show yep. love South Park it's my all-time favorite show <laughs> I watch it every single night I've seen every episode like 10 times and oh. I just think it's hilarious yes. and there's so many people out there that hate the show and they don't find the jokes funny, and I just don't understand why. To me, it's the greatest satire that's ever existed, at least in my age. The way that they do stuff. What is your favorite South Park episode of all time? Um, Probably the Sons of Witches. Yes. I love, honestly, the dad episodes. I love <laughs> all the dad episodes. Randy is by far my favorite character. Yeah, he is he, he is the best. But mine, because I, I saw it when I started playing baseball, is the is the baseball episode where they intentionally try to lose so that they won't have to play again, but then they keep, yeah, that's, that's yeah. hilarious. But what is your, what is your opinion on how they portray Canadians in South Park? No, I love it. I think it's hilarious. <laughs> I always so love funny. it when they did like the Royal Wedding one where they did all those traditions. Oh, that was, that was so funny. Oh, but yeah, yeah, yeah I, that's the, one of my favorites is whenever they do the Canadian stuff, because it's just, it's, it's just so out there, but yeah, it is such a great show. So I was going to ask what your favorite TV show is of all time, but we've already had that answered. So what was the last TV show that you binge watched? Um, to be honest, uh, Ozark on Netflix. I just watched the second season recently and typically I'm not into those kind of shows, but my husband was the one who introduced me to it and yeah, I got hooked on it right away and we watched the whole season within like two nights. Mine is a show that you probably would never guess. New Girl. I binge watched that on Netflix. Yeah. And that, and that was surprisingly good. Yeah, I've only seen a few episodes. I've heard lots of positive yeah. feedback about that show, though. Oh, and I was and I was gonna say Friends, but I've seen that like fifteen times, so that doesn't even that doesn't even that doesn't even count. So, what is a what is your guilty pleasure movie or your go to guilty pleasure movie? Um, I don't know if this is so much a guilty pleasure, but it. I'm a big fan of. Um, wow, sorry, I'm totally blanking right now. Pitch Perfect. Oh, yep. <laughs> Yeah, and to be honest, when it first came out, I did not care about that movie at all. My husband was the one, again, who introduced me to it, and I was like, wait, this movie is hilarious. So, yeah, I'm a fan of that. Okay, you're going to have to control yourself now, because what I'm about to announce, I was going to announce to the, like, later on, probably in a week or so, but I have been emailing with um, Anna Camp, you know her, she's in the movie. Yep. The blonde, her agent, and yep. she's going to be coming on in a couple of months because she launched a charity, and I told her about this page, and I said, you know, we'd love to have her come on talk about her charity, p- promote that, and they said, yeah, give us a few months, and then we finally scheduled a date. It is November 13th. She will be on this podcast, and I did say, I was like, and by the way, I will ask a few Pitch Perfect questions. They said, yeah, it's fine. No no worries. So, yes, everyone out there, November 13th, Anna Camp will be on the show. You heard it here first. So pitch perfect, and I gotta say, my guilty pleasure movie, Princess Bride. I don't care. Okay. I don't care. That's my ultimate date night movie. Watch it anytime. That that to me, it's yeah. I, I I hate to admit that, but it, it just it's a great it's a great movie. So you gotta you gotta you gotta do it. So what is your favorite flavor of ice cream? I'm honestly very boring. I'm a vanilla person. I don't. But to be honest, I don't have much ice cream. I've never been a huge ice cream fan. But if I were to have ice cream, it's always vanilla and plain and basic. It's always a good go-to for me. Mm-hmm. 
Now, we're similar in that we both live in climates that can get very, very cold during the winter and can even get cold in the spring. How is that like for you when it gets super cold? I mean, we'll have light where it's only light like eight hours out of the day. How does that affect your training? Are there some tips that you have for other people that live in cold climates to still have that motivation to go to the gym even though they never they never even want to leave the house? Yeah, I tell them to suck it up. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, like I, in the winter, I'll still run outside <laughs> on average like once a week even if it's a snowstorm. Mm-hmm. I, I just suck it up. I layer up and I go do it. You just got to prepare properly so you know if you if no matter what your goal is if you're serious about that goal you will do whatever it takes to get there so and that it just tells you if their if their goals are important to them or not well and i tell people too it's like what else are you doing there's nothing else to do outside what that's the all that's the perfect time to work out you have so much more free time on your hands and it's just yeah it's one of those things so now we have a few questions here left what is one item that you would die to have if it went up for auction Ooh, that's really tough one item it could be any item in the world any item in the world um i honestly have always really wanted a really nice fancy sports car don't know why as a kid in elementary school that's just something i've always wanted doesn't matter what type it could be it could be even like a lamborghini or anything i don't care i just want a nice little sports car i've always thought they look really cool that yeah that would be that would be awesome we had one competitor on here she was a figure competitor and she said that she would want an entire diamond bikini to wear at her next competition because she said <laughs> the judges wouldn't be able to take their eyes off her so then she'd obviously win and i was like hey that's a winning strategy i guess and then another person said that they want some piece from like titanic stuff like that me personally i don't know what i'd want yet i have a few more podcasts to go before i think i'll answer it so i can have a little bit more time to reflect on it but if you could have dinner with any historical figure who would it be Ooh, that's it. See, that's a tough question for me. I've always been really bad when it comes to knowing famous people and celebrities and their names and everything. So I don't know, like the first person that came to my mind was someone like, it sounds corny, but like Albert Einstein or something Mm -hmm. like that. But if I had more thought about it, I don't think that would actually be my answer to be quite honest. I don't know. That's that's really tough. (laughs) What is one thing, if you had the all-seeing power and you could change anything about the sport of powerlifting, what would it be? Ooh, if I could change anything about the sport of powerlifting. Mm -hmm. So let me just start by saying I understand why athletes use equipment and how it can benefit. But for me personally, if I were to change it and have my own federation, it would be a true raw federation. So you're wearing socks. You're not wearing shoes, just like regular socks. You're not allowed to use knee sleeves. You're not wearing a belt. It's just your basic, basic movements that you're doing. So um, to me, it would be like a true raw powerlifting federation. Mm-hmm. Cause they're not out there. there. There are raw federations, but you're still using equipment in them. So that, that's just me. So for two things, I've always wondered, what do those belts actually do, those big belts, what they wear? What are they, what are they for usually? Yeah, so a lot of people think that it helps to keep your back neutral Mm -hmm. which isn't the case it indirectly helps with that but what it actually does is when you're wearing the belt it helps to give you that more diaphragmatic um, breath and pressure in your stomach so you're getting more intra abdominal pressure it acts as a force to push against that belt and that indirectly helps to keep your back more neutral and if your back's neutral and everything's more tight obviously you're going to have more stability more power when you're doing the lift and it's a lot more safer overall but just wearing the belt is it going to help to keep your back neutral? You have to know how to do that proper brace bracing of your core in order for it to work effectively. And you said also no shoes. Is there a specific reason as to why you wouldn't have anybody wear shoes? Yeah, so a lot of lifters, when you look at a lot of power lifters, they'll wear the special lifting shoes that have that elevation in the heel, and it helps them to get more depth in the movement. So for me, if a lot of, or in a lot of, powerlifters didn't use those lifting shoes um they probably wouldn't even be able to squat to depth to be honest a lot of people it's very different when you're um squatting in a flat shoe or just on your bare feet or in socks or whatever versus wearing that lifting shoe makes a huge difference so for me i have no mobility issues i can squat what they say ass to grass no problem without wearing those shoes but a lot of lifters the second you take those shoes away from them all of a sudden you can tell their mobility restrictions are kicking in because they can't squat properly they can't squat to depth anymore so to me 
that would be really cool to see um, what a big effect that would have on a lot of lifters. I've always had a question too about like specifically the bench press when it comes to powerlifting. We see all these powerlifters, they do the thing where they have their gut. It's basically like they're they're pregnant almost because they're they just have their belly straight out. Yeah. They have their back arched. What is that for? Because, I mean, I was always raised in the old school belief. I mean, that you just sit in a flat line, you just have it go down almost to your chest, and then just push it up. What is the reasoning behind that arching the back and having yourself, like, at an incline? Yes, so the main reason why most people try to get as big of an arch as they can in their back is when you think about the sport of powerlifting, ultimately you're trying to move the most weight, right? So if you have that big arch in your back, you're decreasing the range of motion from the bar to your chest. So if you can do less range of motion, you can ultimately potentially lift a heavier load. But the other main reasoning is when you actually do that arch, if you look, it follows the natural curvature of your spine. So when you do that arch, it's actually safer when you're doing a bench press with an arch back versus a flat back. Um, it takes a lot of stress off your glenohumeral joint, so less, less stress on the shoulders. You're putting the stress on the right areas, in your pecs, in your triceps. Um, you're using your legs as well. But Ultimately, it can help to improve stability, again, um, create more tightness with the body. But ultimately, it is safer for your body to do with an arch. One of the things that I love to ask powerlifters specifically is that when it comes to increasing your lifts, you're not going to go overnight from lifting, let's say, you know, you lift 50 kilograms to lifting 100 kilograms. It's not going to happen. Even after a few months, how do you deal with mentally knowing that, it's such a slow process, especially when it comes to lifts. I mean, you could go from probably, some people might even go from like 55 kilograms to maybe even like 56 over a month. Like it's just super slow when it comes to how much you could lift. Is that really trying on you or is it one of those things where it just makes you want it even more because you know that you're going to have to work hard to get it? Um, it's, yeah, it's definitely a slow progress for most people. Sometimes people we have call what we have newbie games and they will make those dramatic jumps and hit huge PRs and whatnot but it is a slow process but for me it's usually the little wins I focus on oh hey last week when I did this I was out of breath at the end this week when I did it I did the same weight the same reps and, and I don't feel as out of breath so you got to take those little small wins and over time that's what will kind of keep motivating you and driving you to getting that big PR and actually making from day one to day I don't know 200 how much you actually did improve overall. When it comes to your training, are you more of a reps kind of person or do you like to max out? Honestly, I th that's very, very tough because as someone who has a big endurance background as being a runner my whole life. I was going to say that's I've why done, I asked it, yeah. <laughs> I've done lots of high reps and I think when push comes to shove, I do prefer the high reps. It just makes, for me personally, I feel like I'm pushing harder, I'm working harder, and I like that aspect. I always like challenging my body in different ways. Um, whereas when you're doing that one rep max, it's just a single rep. So even though as hard as it is, to me, it's not as much fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Whenever I did the one rep max is just for anything, I just lift it once and I'd be like, oh, we're done now? That's it? Yeah. Like, like it's like, where's the where's the like the all the sweat and all that that comes afterwards so yeah for for me i definitely love love the repetitions but when if someone were to walk up to you on the street and say you know hey i want to become a power lifter i want to get into the power lifting what would be the best piece of advice that you would have for that person in order for them to be successful not just you know lifting heavy but also just you know having doing it the right way and being successful in that they enjoy it um yeah i think there's a couple main things you have to focus on. One, make sure you're hiring the right person. Ultimately, no matter what, if you're gonna take it seriously, you will need to hire a coach at some point down the road. So make sure you do your research. You're getting someone who has the knowledge, who has the experience, not just, as I mentioned before, someone who has 10,000 followers on their Instagram, you know? Like, make sure you're doing your research. You have someone you can trust um, to help you guide you in the right direction, but you have to take it slow and steady as well. As we discussed earlier, you don't make gains really fast. Everything is a slow process. Um, so you have to you have to take your time with it. Mm -hmm. We all have zombie days where, you, I mean, you wake up, you just don't want to go to the gym. You're just like, oh, my God, I can't, I can't do it today. What are some motivating tips or factors that you use in order to psych yourself up to go to the gym? Is it just a lot of people are just like, oh, I just go and do it. But are there any tricks that you like to use kind of maybe to trick your mind into going? Or, or are you just one of those people where you're just like, we're just going to go? For me, um, it's a little bit of both. For me, um, I know that if I don't go, 
I'll probably regret it later. And I always think, because one, I'm always signing up for races. I'm always signing up for powerlifting competitions to compete in. So I know that even though missing one workout, no, it's not that big of a deal. But missing that one workout can affect my training for the rest of the week. And if it affects it for the rest of the week, that's going to affect my program and training in general. And then it kind of leads to that bigger picture overall that technically, yes, that will impact how I perform down the road at that competition that six months away from today. But I think the important thing is um, for people who, you know, don't have the motivation and whatnot is that's the reason why you have to create these sustainable, healthy habits over time. You make those small changes so that the realistic changes and then it just becomes a habit. Just like you get up, you brush your teeth in the morning, every morning. It's the same thing as working out. It's just part of my lifestyle. It's just part of my routine. Even if I don't want to brush my teeth, I still brush my teeth. If I don't want to work out, I still go work out because I know in the long run, it's going to make me feel better. It's going to make everything just better in the long run, really. And I got to say to everyone out there listening, if you do have those two options to choose from, brush your teeth, okay? <laughs> brush your teeth. Don't go to the gym without – come on now, people. You got to have, have some common sense here. But do you have any um, upcoming powerlifting meets that you're getting ready for? Um, I haven't registered for any, but I think I may do one at the end of the year. If not, I'll for sure be doing one called uh, the Grit Power in Edmonton in January. That's always the first powerlifting competition in the new year. Um, so definitely I'll be doing one in January, but I would like to sign up for one before then if I can, but I haven't made any decisions yet. Have you done any powerlifting meets in the States? Uh, no, I have not. Yeah. So I always like to ask this question to people who aren't from the U.S. on the show. What would you say? I mean, we are so closely connected when I think it comes to culture it, that a lot of times Canadians can seem like Americans or Americans seem like, like Canadians. But what would you say is the biggest difference in your in your view of Canadians and Americans? Um, the first thing that comes to my mind is politics. But yeah, uh, but yeah no, um, I don't see a huge difference. I hear a lot of people, I think a lot of Canadians have this notion that oh, Americans, they have the obesity crisis, mm -hmm. they have all this stuff going on. But when you look at the statistics, Canada is very similar to America and those kind of things. Um, so to me, honestly, yeah, they're pretty much Canadians yeah. and Americans are very similar. So if there's Absolutely. not much difference to me. Well, and plus, I, I live in Minnesota, which is probably the most Canadian part of the United States. I mean, just obsessed with hockey. We have probably the, and we are like the healthiest state just because of our trails and everything. But we, we have the sort of upper Midwestern accent that sounds a little Canadian. So I, I get that all the time. And I do have to say, I have told this story once before, but I'll tell it again. The only other country that I've ever visited is Canada, but here's my story. So I had a friend that went up, that was in college in Duluth, and if you don't know, Duluth is about a mile south of the Canadian border, right by, um, it's close to Edmonton-ish, that border. So I visited him over the over the weekend, and he was in class for like four hours, so I said, you know what, I, I want to go up to Canada and just like walk over the border and see what that's like. So I drove up to the border, I asked the border security agent, I said, Hey, can I just park my car on the U.S. side? I just want to literally step over the border, take like a photo just to prove that I was in Canada, and then say like, hey, I'm an international traveler. And they're like, yeah, thousands of people do that every year. They're like, go ahead and do it. Just stepped over the border, took a picture, then got back in my car and drove away. So I'm technically an international traveler, but not in probably the lamest, lamest way possible. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I know. I've always wanted to go to Quebec. That's always been the place I want. I don't speak a lick of French, but I've always wanted to. Say, be yeah, there. why Quebec? Just because I don't know. Like I've looked at the buildings, like Quebec City, and it looks it looked really really cool. But then again, I was like, I, I don't speak French. I don't do any of that. But um, my brother played baseball for a summer in Kelowna, on the on the uh, west coast, and he really enjoyed it. And then he said, I, we always asked him. We said, do they really say a as much as it's advertising? He goes, yeah, it's worse. It's it's more than what you'd think. So, and I you haven't said it yet in I this podcast. Yeah, I know. I was like, she must be really good about it because she hasn't said it this podcast. But when it comes to saying a, how how much does that ever apply in your powerlifting language? You ever go walk up to people and be like, oh, that's a nice lift there, eh? To be honest, it's part of my regular vocabulary, and I probably <laughs> don't even realize the amount of times I do say it. But years ago, I remember someone actually pointing that out about how much Canadians say a. And then I started to realize how much I say it. it is. It's part of my regular vocabulary. Like, I couldn't tell you how many times I say it, but I know I say it on a daily basis, multiple times, for sure. Did your husband propose by saying you want to get married, eh? 
No, you don't. <laughs> now, that would be the most Canadian Canadian yeah. thing ever to happen. And again, you guys, I mean, Erica Smith, we're going to leave a link down to her Instagram page down below. Go follow her. She is so inspirational, especially being that, like we, we've reiterated a hundred times, she doesn't have that stereotypical powerlifter look, but she's just as good as any of them. And it's super, super inspirational. And she does the running too, which is a thing that really, I mean, you don't see mix a lot. And you can go and follow her also for some nutritional advice. She does a lot of that type of stuff. And it's really, I mean, overall, just a super positive influence to follow, especially in this day and age, like what we've talked about kind of a little bit with the obesity crisis. I mean, everyone go and give her a follow. And Erica, is there anyone that you'd like to give a shout out to? Um, I will give a shout out to you won't know who this is, but Sweet Baby Jesus sixty nine. <laughs> that is a great. That is a great name. So, and yeah, in and of itself, I will. I will do that. And now I forgot. We have two final questions. I like to ask every guest before we leave. My first question is: If you could talk to the eighteen year old version of Erica, what would be the best piece of advice that you would give her? Um. Hmm. That's honestly that is so tough because like I I'm kind of those, one of those people I'm like I have no regrets every mistake <laughs> I've made in life led me to where I am kind yeah. of thing but I think it would just be to trust yourself and have more confidence. Um, growing up I didn't have much confidence in myself like most people you know especially in the teenage years and stuff and it wasn't until I met my husband like he's the one who has boosted my self-esteem on a daily basis and my confidence is so much higher and now it's because of him like I start to realize these things and I believe in myself a lot more so yeah it's just to have yeah have more confidence in yourself and as a kid adults I think tell kids that all the time and it's just one of those things that even though you want confidence you don't have the confidence but I think most people as they get older they start to realize themselves and have how many strengths they really truly do have and they're focusing on their strengths not their weaknesses so yeah and lastly if we were in an alternate universe where you weren't into powerlifting or running at all what do you think you would be doing Ooh. um almost something space related like I don't know if it would be necessarily like working for NASA or something but that was something else when I was younger that I would read a lot of other than science in terms of health and fitness I'd read a lot of science about just like the galaxy and stars and stuff like that it was something that for whatever reason kind of I got I was attracted to so yeah mm -hmm. something like that probably and I was gonna I, I was thinking about asking this but I'm gonna go, go, go ahead and ask it anyways knowing that you like South Park have you ever are you a fan of Trailer Park Boys to be honest, I was never that, that crazy into it. I've seen yeah. lots of episodes and stuff, but for whatever reason, it never really grew on me. Yeah. I was just going to say because I live in Bloomington in Minnesota, and we got the Mall of America, and they visited one place, and I actually ran into them when they were filming their thing there at the Mall of America. So I was like, oh, my God, that's Trailer Park Boys. That's Bubbles and everything. So, yeah, that was that was definitely a great thing for me. So, again, everyone, Erica, we cannot thank you enough for having you on the show. Everyone, like I said before, go and follow her. Highly recommend it. And, oh, oh yeah, and lastly, you, you've listed your best lifts that you have, but are there any, is there, like, a potential, like, ideal, like, amount that you would like to lift for each of your lifts? Do you have that, or are you just thinking, you know, I'm just going to progress and see as much as I can possibly do? Yeah, for me, um, to be honest, I have looked at the open records for my category to see how far away I am from them um ideally the biggest thing for me I don't know why would be to bench um 70 kilos so that would be five kilos off from the current record um and I am like make progressing to that which is really cool so that's actually attainable for me I think which is awesome for my squat I don't know why I would like to just squat 200 pounds. That's something I should be able to do by now, but I haven't been able to do. Um, my deadlift, I've already reached my goal of that. Like I wanted to deadlift twice my body weight, squat mm -hmm. twice my body weight. I've deadlifted more than twice my body weight already. Um, but my ultimate goal for that is probably, I think would be around like 250 pounds. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's the tough thing. To be honest, that's why I don't focus on the numbers too much. I'm just taking it progress by progress step by step you know little increments here and there so hopefully maybe one day i will be 
competing for Team Canada or something, yeah. that would be awesome. But I'm just taking baby steps right now. I was gonna say now if you bench twice your body weight, now that would be a now that would be something to see. But yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That but again, be, everyone that would be blowing away the current record. Oh <laughs> yeah, that would be one of those things where they're like, yeah, we got to test her after the show. Everyone, there's something, there's something wrong, and then you'd be like, yeah, I, I did it. Yeah, everything good. So, but again, everyone can't recommend her most and erica thank you so much for coming on the show we really appreciate it we learned a lot and we learned about more about canada too we learned you know about the a's we learned about everything so everyone out there every like i said go and check her out and this is dd on the spot ryan johnson signing out have a great day everyone thanks